Praise the Lord. Okay, so uh, I wanted to uh, today to talk to you for a few minutes about finding your place in the mission of God. And this is a little thumbnail version of the kind of teaching that I will be doing for campuses and student leaders, as well as missionaries that are going to campuses. Um, you just kind of aim it a little different to the level people are on. But it's the kind of training I want to do. Uh, I'll be training in culture sometimes and training in um, uh, relating with the, the, our churches and, and sending groups. But most of the time, I'm going to be talking about the Word of God because God's Word is the foundation for life. Right. Here is what is revealed that we couldn't know otherwise. Some things, if you just go looking long enough, you figure it out. But there's other <coughs> truths, truths that we cannot know unless someone gives us information that we didn't have. And, in, uh, you know, we're talking about universities, so academia builds on the last generation and the last and all the, the dissertations and the books written in the past. But at the beginning, someone had to start learning somewhere, right? And in, in spiritual walk, in, in knowing God, it is crucial. You understand how I'm talking? It is crucial that we look back to the actual, what is revealed that we could not know just by thinking about it. That's right. And so that's the crucial value of this amazing book. As Christians, we do not worship the paper and the binding, the leather, or something like that. We worship the God who wrote the book. Yes. So the point is, we don't worship the words, but we pay attention to the words, because the words are from God, yes. and they reveal what we could not know any other way. Amen. So our reverence is to God who is speaking. And in the same way that a teacher of young children, and they're all talk, 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 and they might actually say, be quiet. Or, for that case, a teacher of college students who are talk, 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 <laughs> passing notes to people back and forth on the front row. No, I don't know if they ever did that. But, but <laughs> and they might say, you know, be quiet, pay attention, I'm your teacher. Okay? Uh, so I believe God wants us to pay attention and say, I am speaking. And that is this this holy moment. So could we tell the Lord we expect to hear from Him today? Yes. Let's bow our heads in a short prayer and our hearts and let's ask the, tell the Lord, Lord, I'm expecting something. In fact, say, just say it together with me. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I'm expecting something. I'm expecting Please, something. Speak Please speak to me through your word, through your word which stands forever, stands forever and reveals what I couldn't know any other way. And reveals what I couldn't know. Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Okay, so finding your place in the mission of God. I have a short story. It's actually a true story to tell you. When I was being raised in Nigeria, my father, who's now in heaven with God, he passed away in 2005, but my mother's still a missionary, so it's amazing. But my father, uh, he was a teacher, in, in, in he developed an advanced school in Nigeria, the first advanced school for Assemblies of God churches in Nigeria. And there were all these pastors that came to be the first students to get the first BA degrees that they could offer in their church school. So here they are there, and they're very motivated. These people came, you know in America you have to tell students to study usually. You have to say, now you've got to study between classes, you know. And, uh, uh, but in those days in Africa, you didn't have to tell anyone to study. They were all studying. In fact, my dad, you know, and they didn't, we didn't have electricity all the time. We had lights, but you had to turn on a diesel power generator which I had to turn on sometimes, I had to go stick the handle on the crank, turn it around and get it going faster and faster, and at just the right moment, and you pushed a button, <laughs> but when you pushed the button, you also had to pull out the handle, right? right. Uh, because it, there's, a, there's a thing turning here like an axle of a truck, and when you push the button, it's going to jump forward with electricity and spark into life this huge generator, and if you don't pull the handle out, the handle will spin faster than the eye can see until it flies off and breaks your neck, you know? And so, so you had to turn the handle, push the button, pull the handle. There was a lot of excitement for a 12-year-old. Well, this was a big, a big thing. But um, the generator would go on in about dusk, and by 8.30 or 9, we'd uh, turn it off because you had to pay for all the diesel. So no more lights, right? But that didn't mean studying was over down in those dorms because they would light a little lamp. They called it a tilly lamp or, or a bush lamp, and it was pretty much... Just one step ahead of pictures from the back of your Bible about the Bible days where there's oil and more kerosene and a little wick and it would light up. And uh, they would flare up and smoke, you know. They'd turn, kind of try to make it smaller. And finally when the light was 
like this just study. Then they sit and read. And they'd read sometimes all night. So my father had to make a rule. For, he was principal. Had to make a rule that you cannot study past, you know, 12 o'clock. Imagine having to tell the students, no more study. <laughs> you study too much. <laughs> okay. Now we have some friends whose background is in China, and they're thinking, of course, doesn't everybody? <laughs> but Americans don't study very well. <laughs> okay, so, so anyway, <laughs> you know, some of them do. But, but they had to make the rule. And so it was very rare for a student to miss class. But one day a student missed class, and then the next day he missed, and the next day he missed. So my father asked, where is so and so? Oh, they said. He has been sick. Oh, what's the matter? Well, he's just oh, everywhere, everywhere. You know, he's sick sometimes, and it happened again. And he's in his bed. He can't even hardly get out of his bed. My father said, well, let me go see him. <laughs> if he's that sick, let me go see him. Maybe I can pray for him. So my dad goes to the dorms and went inside. And he came into the room. <laughs> Here's a man, an African man, very sick indeed. And by his bed, you know, there's his books laying around. They're not being opened right now. He's too sick. But on his bed, there were medicine bottles. Not one or two. Many medicine bottles. Many. And they're open and there's pills of different colors and shapes everywhere. And so my father asked, how are you? He said, oh, I said, so what, where is this medicine? Did you get this medicine from a doctor? He said, oh, no. <laughs> so where did the medicine come from? Well, it came from my friends, the other students here in the school. <laughs> well, why? What, what is it for? Well, they know I'm sick, and so they told me, well, you know, I was sick once, and the doctor gave me this, so <laughs> now they, maybe it will help you. And so they're sharing their medicine. Well, well, it's very nice, unless you know a bit about the science of medicine, and then you get a little worried. So Dad got worried about what on earth is they giving to this man. He said, he looked at one, it's a medicine for high blood pressure. He looks at another one, it's a medicine for low blood pressure. <laughs> <laughs> There's all these different things, malaria, you always take medicine for malaria, you know, there's medicine for other, many different kinds of medicine, and they're all just trying to help their friend. Well, he finally got into a real doctor, a real hospital, and they looked at him again, and they finally came in and they gave a diagnosis. Well, he has a specific disease. It wasn't high blood pressure or low blood pressure. He had Hansen's disease. If you look it up in an encyclopedia, you'll say, oh, <laughs> but he had a bad disease. <laughs> and uh, that man was taking every kind of medicine that wasn't for the disease. When you are really sick, you will go out of your way to find the right medicine. Yes. And if you know that not every medicine is equal, you won't just take any old medicine, right? You'll go for the right one. How much would you give if your life was on the line for the right medicine? That's really the question that Christians are bringing in a, we hope, a respectful way, a loving way. But in an honest way, we're bringing this question to our generation, to our world. We're asking our world, if the sin, if the, if the disease is fatal, if there's only one possible cure, how valuable is the right medicine? Amen. So, well, that's very, uh, that's very arrogant of you. Not if the medicine works. If the medicine works, it's not arrogant, it's urgent. Now, if I'm trying to make money from the medicine, then that's a problem. If I'm <laughs> Jesus wouldn't let them pay for his work. One time in the book of Acts, a man tried to say, let me pay for, for this work. And, and Peter, the apostle Peter said, and in no circumstances do you pay me for something that God did. Yes. He says, there's only one medicine. It's something God does for the human condition. But how valuable, how much would you look, how hard would you look, and how much would you give if you found the medicine that could save your being? All right? So this is what uh, I'm referring to when I talk about the mission of God. Let's go to some of these pictures quickly here today. If I look at that clock, does it tell me something or not? Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Now, if I get into African mode, and, you know, it's been three or four hours, and I'm talking away. Just wave your hand or do something. I may forget. <laughs> I, no, I won't go that long. <laughs> okay. But we also worked in Ethiopia when we were a young couple. And in Ethiopia, the people told me, they said, just talk a long time. And I said, well, how long? I said, well, until, you know, until you've said something. <laughs> I said, well, how, how long really, though? How long? And they said, you know, in the city, it's a little different. In the city, we have to take the bus. We, we do have to go home in the city. He said, however, in the countryside... 
In the countryside, they said, if we came to Sunday, the people come walking, walking, walking a long way. They said, if we invited you to speak, if after two hours you stopped talking, imagine it. The people would say, doesn't he have anything to say? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not going to be Ethiopian for you, but, but you can wave your hand if you think it's time to stop. Okay, here's our family. This is Lisa and I, and this is our, our son. He's 21 years old now. He's a junior in university, and uh, he's studying Bible to be a teacher now. That's what he's settled down on, so that's very exciting. And there's our daughter, Lauren, and she is 19, and she's a freshman in the university, both in the same school in Missouri. So that's our family that you pray for us. And the uh, Castrovas used to take care of them when they were little, right? And uh, they weren't that tall. Oh. <laughs> you know, they're both taller than both of you now. But anyway, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so, <okay. laughs> Now, this is a picture of what we do. Just recently, we were in Indiana. This is at the uh, Illinois, I mean, Indiana University in Bloomington, Illinois. It's a big science classroom, but that's a Chi Alpha group meeting. 200 young people serving God, wow. living a holy life, trying to go against the flow of their university, which is very much a different kind of university, and serving the Lord, and we got to share a, 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 a service there. So it's just a picture of what we're, what's going on that we're trying to help. Wow. Then the next picture we had, oh, that was at Purdue University. Wow, what is this? There's, they're seeing a lot of their friends and all. And so this was International Night a few months ago, and they, people invited their friends, and they were all singing, wearing clothes and singing songs about Jesus. And many of them weren't really Jesus followers, but they really liked to sing, and they really liked to wear their clothes. And we had a wonderful night, and we drank tea afterwards. And, oh, so it was a very nice night, and there's some of their good friends there. All right. This was the picture in Houston, Texas, in January, of that big national gathering of Pi Alpha, where 6,000 students came. Wow. And 2,000 students signed a card with their name and information saying, God spoke to my heart and I'm going to give one year of my life to missions or ministry. Wow. 2,100 students and more since before and since. And because there's more than 2,000 students wanting to give a year of their life for Jesus, that's why we're responding to a call to teach them. Okay, so we're, it's for those people. That's why we're doing what we're doing. Okay, next. These are just some pictures of making disciples. <laughs> okay. That's a trip to Nigeria. A man who discipled me a lot, Denny Miller. And he preaches about the Holy Spirit all over Africa. And we were teaching some other people, and they honored us by giving us robes. Nigerian robes. Velvet. It's hot in Nigeria. They give a velvet robe. It's hot. There's lions. And there's gold buttons. And a little white hat made in Czechoslovakia. I don't understand that. But anyway. That, and... and uh, I wrote on Facebook, I said, oh, I had a wonderful day today, uh, they robed us uh, uh, in the ceremony, and someone wrote back on Facebook from America and said, oh, I'm sorry, how much did they get? No, no, I said, robe, not robbed, they robed us, <laughs> <laughs> they robed us, so, anyway, but you see, this is when our kids were smaller, and uh, these are some of the kind of disciples we had, see that girl, she was a, a student, just newly saved, actually, but now she's a missions, a missions pastor. And wow. who is this other picture here? Yes, What's that? Yes. Oh! This is in one of the most remote countries in Africa that almost nobody goes to. It's called Burundi. Burundi. And uh, we went there and we were teaching. This man had given, he'd come up on crutches as a former soldier from the war they had. And I thought he wanted prayer for his leg. Then I looked and, and he had a fake leg. He didn't have a leg. But, uh, but, but he said, no, I don't want prayer for my leg. I want my heart to be right with God. I want to give my life to Jesus. And so we prayed for him, and then the next week, at a different place, we're having more meetings, and he showed up. That's why we're all happy. We're smiling, we're like, hey, look how big he's... He found something. He had found an answer for something going on in his, in his life, his body, but most of all, in his soul. Yeah. And the joy and the peace. So he'd come all the way across Bujumbura, a big city, all the way to the other side to talk to us. And so we make disciples. We make disciples. That's our heart cry. <laughs> And when I come to your church, you see Andrew and Rachel, and I read about a multicultural family of servant missionaries sent to make disciples who make disciples for Jesus. See, I didn't do all that, but I'm back there in the story somewhere, watching. And I can't, I can't thank the older Pestrovas or the younger Pestrovas enough for having a heart so that we can cooperate and inspire and mobilize God's people that there could be ministry that wasn't there before 
from the most familiar town you know, off to the ends of the earth. That's a picture of what we're trying to do. Amen? Okay, so moving on then. This was in Ethiopia in November, and I got to go back and find your place in the mission of God. That man actually leads a national church of, of another, another, not Assemblies of God, but another Pentecostal church. And those are his two daughters. And uh, one of them is in school, and the other one, she is a lawyer. And that is how we're going to Ethiopia. But they love Jesus. They found their place in God's kingdom. They're working to advance that people get the answer for their soul that they're looking for. And I just wanted you to see that the family of God is very big. Sometimes you might feel it's small, but no, it's very big. Yeah. It's, very, it's bigger than you realize. Yes. And you're part of something that's miraculous because it's reaching all around the earth. One reason I am a Christian is because I've seen the same Jesus touch people, different people in the same way all over the world. Mm -hmm. And the people that can't even, two Christians can't even talk, they don't even know the same language, but this Bible produces the same fruit in both lives. Mm -hmm. And I said, United Nations can't do that. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> International treaties can't do that. <laughs> Even business, although people will get along long enough to buy and sell, but it really can't do that. But what can do that? Jesus can do that. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, God is on a mission. Will you say that line with me? God, God is, is on a mission. mission. And He is giving each one of us a part to play in the mission of God. That's really the message today. Let's read it together out loud one more time. You ready? God, God is on a mission, and he is giving each one of us a part to play in the mission of God. Now, there are some people who think, if God wants me to work, oh, no, I have to work. Oh. That's, that's not the right attitude. It's more the other side of attitude that says, God wants to share his work that will endure forever, that produces a harvest that never ends? He wants to give me a part to play in that work? <laughs> oh, wow. Imagine uh, imagine somebody who uh, likes to play football out here in the square, maybe, maybe in, in during break in classes at university, okay? And, and here comes the Green Bay Packers coach, and he's standing on the sideline watching, and he looks over and he says, I want you to come play football on the Packers. And imagine the guy saying, Oh, man, that's so much work. <laughs> I'm going to sweat. I'll take a shower every night. I'll hurt. I'll have bruises on my body. Oh, do I have to play for the Packers? <laughs> There's not too many people in Wisconsin that would be that way about playing for the Packers. And there shouldn't be too many people in God's church that should be that way about working for Him on His mission. Amen? We get to work on something that is honorable and powerful and amazing and it lasts forever. Hallelujah. Amen. So that is something that makes me excited. Praise God. And this uh, story is the story of what happens. This is the story of the Bible. So if you were to open your Bible in Genesis chapter 1, the very first verse we read is, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So what's the story of God's interaction with humanity? And what's the Bible all about? Well, the Bible is all about God's mission. And God's mission is all about the answer for the human need everywhere in the world. <laughs> and the fact that the God who has an answer is pulling us to, to work with Him and giving the answer to somebody else. Does that make sense? The God who has an answer is looking for somebody who is willing to, to come with Him and say, come with me and help give away the answer to somebody else. Okay, that's, that, that's the story. That's exactly what the Bible is about in a very short form. And there's a lot of Christians who don't know that. <laughs> there's a lot of Christians who say, well, it's a religion, it's tradition, uh, there, there, there's rules, Ten Commandments, and some churches have uh, Ten Hundred Commandments, and, you know, there's all these rules. <laughs> or, <laughs> no, it's about God dealing with the most central problem in, in each human's heart, and asking those who believe in him, come and help me as I work on that problem. Yes. That's right. okay? Some people will help him as a pastor of a church. Some people will help him as a retiree, serving God in their community, reaching out. Some people will reach him as a student in a university. Some people will be a, a chemist or, or a postdoc research. Amen? But they will be advancing God's mission by sharing the answer as they move through life. Yes. This is what the story is about. We get to work with God. We don't have to save people. Because only God can save people. Right. But we can tell people about salvation. Yes. 
That's our work. That's our part in the mission of God. Oh, hallelujah. Yes. Do you know that word? Some of you are church people. Some of you is kind of new. When Christians get excited, they say, hallelujah. <laughs> it's a Hebrew word from the, from the Old Testament. But it's celebrating. God is real. Glory to God. Glory to the one who is glorious. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's what yeah. we would say. So, amen. Yeah. Praise God. Okay, moving on. The creation. Whose glory is displayed in creation? You know, I think the mountains are the, just the most beautiful thing in the world. I was born in Colorado. My wife thinks that the ocean, the, the waves coming onto the shore, is the most beautiful thing in the world. Yeah. Her family were from the panhandle of Florida. And we've been married 25 years. Did I mention that? Oh, I think I did, yeah. I've been 25 years. And, uh, and, and I like mountains and she likes the ocean. And so every year we get together and plan a family vacation, and every year we go to the ocean. Okay, but... <laughs> <laughs> because I'm a smart man. <laughs> no, but actually, uh, we, we, she's, last year we went to mountains. It was very, very enjoyable. Maybe we'll go back again in 20 years. <laughs> <No. laughs> but, but when we see creation, sometimes we just realize this is amazing. It's awesome. Who? It's glorious. But whose glory does it display? If I look at a very, very nice Mercedes Benz, De this declares the glory of German engineering, right? <laughs> Ferrari. <laughs> this is the passion of Italian engineering and design. <laughs> right? uh, the Hugo, I don't know. I don't know what the Hugo is. <laughs> when the Hugos were being sold in America, there was a, from former Yugoslavia, there was a Yugoslavian Christian that spoke at a meeting I was at. And he was, he, he said, I saw in the paper you were buying Yugos. And the, the everyone kind of laughs. And, because then the Hugo was like super cheap, you know, three thousand dollars. <laughs> he said, "I saw you buying Hugos." And he said, "Why?" <laughs> it was very funny. <laughs> Whose glory is displayed in the creation? You know, even if you live in a country that's known for the mountains, you may identify with the mountains, but did you make the mountains? If you live on an island and the beauty of the ocean is there, but did you make the island? You're just living on it. Whose glory is shown in creation? And the Bible starts off by saying that the world around us shows us that there is a God who is glorious. His detail, his wisdom, his insight, the way he balances the forces in the nature, the way he creates the life, it declares the glory of God. Whether you look on the grand scale, or you zoom in very small like the flower, or maybe much smaller than that, you look at the molecular level and the, the marvels that are only can be seen in a microscope. Whose glory is Glory of God. Glory of God. Next slide. Move on in the story to the fall. Because early on in the book, in the Bible, but after Genesis 1 and 2, everything is good. But by Genesis chapter 6, this line is in the scripture. It says that God looked down on mankind and saw that every inclination of his heart was only evil all the time. And you look on the evil of man, and it says, and the heart of God was filled with pain. Why is sin wrong? Well, it's on the list, and God said no. Why is sin actually wrong? You know, a better answer is that we damage the world we made through sin. Maybe even better than that is the answer, we damage the people that he made in his image. Yeah. But the ultimate answer of all is, we bring pain to God, who is loving and perfect and deserves no pain and no such treatment. When we hurt his world, we're hurting the thing that he created to show his glory. When we hurt people, we're damaging people made in the image of God. The only things in all of creation that when God speaks, they can answer back. And we will go and hurt and damage these people made in God's image? Some people say, well, why is it like sleeping with just whoever? Why is that wrong? Why, why would it be wrong? Just, why can't I just have sex with anybody that's out there, you know, that whoever comes along? Because you're damaging bit by bit, person after person after person made in the image of God, and you're damaging yourself made in the image of God. Amen. So God's saying, my rules are not arbitrary. Today, I care about you and the other people. And the best way 
to live is not to be damaging yourself as you go along. It's to build something that where you build up one other person and they build you up and your 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 life is increased by being by being together, not being damaged by these things. What about stealing? Why, why is that wrong? I don't know. It's wrong because he's bigger than me. He beat me up if I steal from him. No, no, no. That's <laughs> It's wrong to steal because we're taking from people made in God's image who have their own needs. And, and we're not learning the right way to develop in our own life. And so we're not honoring ourselves as if we're able to do something when God helps us. You know? there, there's so many things that fall back to this being made in the image of God. By, you say, well, how did it happen? For Genesis 1, everything is good. To Genesis 6, every thought in the man's mind was only evil all the time. And God is filled with pain that he made man on the earth. <laughs> What happened? What happened was in chapter 3, it says sin. The story of people falling into sin, rebelling against God. Because sin is not just, oh, I made a little mistake. I slipped up a little bit. I had some bad manners to go up for God. Sometimes they're small children. You know, we invite, we introduce them to our friends, and they say something they're not supposed to say. <laughs> that can be very embarrassing. <laughs> I saw a picture of a little boy. The parents are talking to an old, an old person, an old, you know, a respectful old friend. And, 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 and the boy's carrying a chair. And he, and he says, My dad said you can talk a leg off one of these things. You know, so, <laughs> that's an American phrase, talk a leg off the chairs. It means yeah. you talk a lot. So, 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 but that's just kind of like, oh, the child is just being a little embarrassing. Sometimes somebody comes up to you and says, Hi, but they have bad breath. And in America, I don't know other cultures, in America, you're not supposed to have bad breath, right? So that's embarrassing. But this is not just embarrassing, this is rebellion. This is saying, God, who always loves me and says this is best, and I don't think he's right, and I don't want to obey, and I want to do it my way. That's right. And that sin is what led to things like this. This actually was a church that was burned down close to where I went to high school in Nigeria um, many years later after I was there. But there's two religions that are struggling on this fault line, and they've been killing Christians there for, for 10 or 15 years now. Sometimes in the night, come in and there's a small village and they'll kill everybody that they can catch unless you can run fast. They, they all die. And they do as a church. People make, make my, my family in Christ. Some of you and my family in Christ may have died in that building when that, when that was burned down. And it's, it's, it's just because of sin. It's because of sin that people end up harming and damaging and destroying one another. And so the question is who turned away? And the answer is God didn't turn away. God was loving. He told us the way to go. People turned away. So there's trouble in the world. Why? Because of sin. Who's responsible? People. And all around us, we hear told, people are good. They're basically good. Do you know what the Bible actually says? The Bible actually says people are not basically good. But they're very, very valuable. Yes. And we need to see the difference. Because if the world hears a Christian saying people are not basically good, but, oh, you hate us, you, you hate everybody. God says you're very valuable, but none of you are good. So that's a little bad news at the beginning of the good news. Amen? All right. People are not basically good, but very valuable. And God says, I can redeem them. They cannot redeem themselves. I can redeem them. I can redeem them. And so that's what comes to our next slides. Uh, God promises in Genesis 12, 3 to one man, Abraham. Now, it wasn't really a black family, but I kind of like this picture. I think it's great. And here it is. Uh, and it wasn't a white family either, you guys. <laughs> okay, if you're a white person. We have all these white Jesuses and white... Um, <laughs> okay, let's be a little more honest maybe. But anyhow, um, someone said they thought the men in Jesus' time wore a long pigtail in the back, but you know, but that just doesn't work in our culture, so I don't know. She said, no. Please don't grow one of those, Andrew. I don't know. But, uh, but, but whatever, whatever way they were, you know, that God comes into our cultures and speaks to us. And here's this family rejoicing in the Lord. And, and uh, it's sort of an African version of Pentecost on, on this picture. You know, the flame is coming down and God is anointing people. But this, this story of uh, that God is giving us power to touch our world, this goes all the way back to Genesis 12, where God spoke to a man, Abraham. And he said, you're going to have a descendants. And your family will become a family. And your family will bless Every nation in the world. 12.3. Every Christian should know where to find Genesis 12.3. <laughs> it's right after Genesis 12.2. <laughs> Through you, Abraham, all nations on earth will be blessed. That promise is repeated a second time in Genesis to Abraham. 
and a third time in Genesis to Abraham, and a fourth time in Genesis to Abraham's son Isaac, and a fifth time in Genesis to Isaac's son Jacob. Five times it is the defining promise of the book of Genesis, the introduction to the Bible. Through a family that follows me, I will bless every kind of people in the world that there are. Amen. And Galatians chapter 3 says to us, we who believe in Jesus have become the children of Abraham. Yes. We are bringing the gospel to the whole world so that the whole world can know the glory and the goodness of God. Amen. So you take Genesis 12 and then you go to Galatians 3. And if you ever are put in charge of Bible study and don't know what to say, try that. <laughs> okay. Because then you'll be reminding people God has a mission. He's going to bless every people in the world, every kind of people in the world. And he's including us. Not to do the whole thing, but to be part of the thing. That's right. He's including us to play a part of his mission. Amen. So say it with me. Genesis 12, 3. Genesis 12, 3. Galatians chapter 3. And Galatians, Galatians chapter, chapter 3. 3. The mission of God. The mission of God. Woo, you're ready to teach Bible study. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Well, let's just do a couple more things before I'm done here. The next uh, picture. Uh, the, oh, this is the Galatians 3, so 3, 6, 2, 9. Look, I have Indian picture here. But I don't, I don't know about where all the Indian people are. But anyway, there. <laughs> no, this is, this is awesome. This is actually a young, a young lady, American girl, that I taught in a, in a Christian college and told her, you can minister on campuses. And she did it. And this was 17 years ago, and she's still doing it. Perfect. <laughs> and she's the girl in the, in the pink. But she married an Indian from India, and then she went back for a family wedding in India and everything. So you see the nations all... Uh, but they're still campus ministers at Southern Methodist University in Dallas, Texas, which is not Methodist, but anyway. And so it's, a, there, it's an incredible uh, picture of trying to bless the nations, what, what that girl is, is, and her husband are doing. The promise to Abraham is in action. Who will God use? What kind of people will God use is a big question. And the answer is people like you, people like me. He's looking to people like us. So you can't say, I'm retired, God won't use me. You can't say, I haven't graduated yet, God won't use me. You can't say, I'm not a very good Christian. Because anybody that wants to can become a better Christian just by letting the Lord help you. Amen. Because nobody's